everybody. Yeah, right. I didn't have a mask on earlier. This mask was to make a point. So we are, we are um, in that season where we're approaching the time where Somerset fans pray for emotionally, physically, and mentally wounded St. George's fans. And so I live in Shelly Bay, right? I don't know if you guys have seen this. So every day, I drive along Shelly Bay stretch, right? And this is the first house I see. And listen, these two houses tell a story about what's been going on in Cup Match for the last couple of years, right? So I come by this house. Now this morning I came by and they have more stuff out. Flags in the front. It's got red and blue um, umbrellas. Now, you can just see the car, but the car is red, and it has flags all on it, right? And you go three houses done. Just three houses done. And here's what you see. <laughs> and I, I heard, I heard that there's a certain radio personality, Nikita Robinson, who is on the air, because she lives down that way too, who is actually pleading with people, because this is a St. George's fan, to pool their resources to make this house a little bit more comparable to this house. But here's what I suggest. I suggest they pool their resources and not get stuff for this house, but get resources for their club. Yeah. Because I think that would be... So, listen... We're not going to, me and my family are going to be away over cup match. So the rest of you Somerset fans, please represent. Okay? You, you notice I... My question would be, my question would be, when you say St. George is all the way, all the way where? Huh? Yeah, I know. Win? What? See? Win, you mean, look, here's what you used to say. I'm St. George's lose or draw. Don't say the first word. because All right. Okay. I'm just playing. I love you all. Let me get that off the screen. Before um, we start on this topic, which is a huge, huge, huge topic, and probably the most significant topic that we could ever consider, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little, not worried, but I've never taught kind of like this before. Normally, you know, we're practical. We want to. This is just all we're going to do today is consider the love of God. That's all we're going to do. Understanding that everything has its being because of the love of God. Do you realize everything exists because of the love of God. And the love of God impacts every single thing that we do. Every decision, every interaction, we are influenced or we're not influenced by the love of God. I want you to consider the Job interaction. So Satan is speaking to God, and here's what he says. He says, the only reason Job loves you is not because he loves you, it's because he loves what you do for him. So the whole interaction is whether or not God, whether or not Job understands that God loves him and whether or not he loves God. And so what, what Satan is trying to do is to, to, to prove to God that Job only loves him because of what he has. He doesn't love you. And every interaction, every decision that we take, the love of God is present. Whether or not we make a decision for God depends on whether or not we know we are loved and whether or not we love 
here. Every single time we sin, every single time our morality gets up, our obedience, our holiness, our righteousness, all of righteous living, that is, all of that relates to our understanding of whether or not we are loved and whether or not we love him. And here is a question that God challenged me with. Because I don't know about you, but so many times in my Christian experience, I've asked, like there have been times where, I don't know about you, but I have these tangible times where I know God loves me. I don't know, you sit in there and you're just contemplating the love of God and you know for certain he loves you. And it's this, this feeling that comes over me, it's unbelievable. But then there are other times in my Christian experience where I have questioned God's love for me. And here's a question that God asked me, Eversley, what is it you need to know or what is it you need to have happen to be consistently convinced that you are loved by me? Now think about that. What is it you need to know? What knowledge do you lack? Or what is it that you need to have happen? What thing don't you have to be consistently convinced that you were loved by me? Do we need our lives to be perfect to realize that we are perfectly loved? The awesome thing about the writers of these songs, of most of the songs that we are inspired by, you would think that the writers wrote these things like in awesome times, you know? Like, and then we find out like, It Is Well With My Soul was written by a man who just lost his whole family. But this song was written by Frederick M. Lehman. And here's when he wrote it. He wrote The Love of God in 1917. He was a businessman who just lost everything in a deal that went wrong. When he wrote the song, he was working packing oranges and lemons to get back on his feet. Let me tell you something about this man. At the lowest point in his life, he encountered the love of God. You know what this tells me about the love of God? We can encounter it and actually know about it no matter where we are. We could be at our lowest point and at our highest point and encounter the love of God. So all of these songs, all of these songs that were written, in our minds we probably think these guys had to be in a great place with God when they wrote it or in a great place with their life. But they were in a great place with God, but often they were not in a great place in their life. Written hundreds of years ago and still impacting us today. Psalm 36, verse 7 says this. How priceless is your unfailing love. All through the Bible, the love of God is described. Priceless, unmeasurable, can't be weighed. It endures forever. There is no human measurement for the love of God. And see, here's our problem. I don't know about you, but all of the things that relate to God are hard for me to wrap my mind around. Whenever I consider that God lives forever and he had no beginning and he has no end, I struggle to wrap my mind around it because we live in space and time. And things are measured for us. And so we have this concept of this love of God that is beyond measure. How do we grasp it? And then what we do is, there's this thing that can't be measured, but we try to measure it based on space and time. So we come to conclusions about God's love based on our experiences and our feelings. You go through something bad, you feel bad, and then you say, God, do you love me? So what I'm doing is I am making, drawing a conclusion about whether or not God loves me based on my feelings. When I don't know about you, but my feelings are impacted by so many different things. Impacted by, like, I, I remember one time being in, my, my feelings being impacted by somebody, what somebody else did, which God calls sin. But what I was doing because of the impact of it in my life was going, God, where are you? God, do you love me? So we have feelings and our experiences that are affected by a number of things, and instead of drawing conclusions about God's love based on his truth, we try to measure it. Like, we try to, to get it in, a, you know, in, in this thing that we can understand. Now, what the writers of Scripture do, what the writers of Scripture do, what God does in his word, 
And what the writers of that beautiful hymn do is they paint us pictures that cause us to understand something about the enormity of the love of God. And that's what we're going to do. We're, cons- we're going to consider some of the things that the writers of Scripture and even that hymn writer say. So here's Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason, for what reason? Before that, Paul was talking about salvation and uh, the Gentiles and the Jews being reconciled under Christ. So he says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, what we can, co- what we can understand by what we have just read, whatever he is going to talk about next is beyond us. The only, we, the only way that we can even understand what he's going to talk about next is through the power of the Spirit in our inner being and Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith. We cannot understand it on our own. And oftentimes, that's what we try to do. Aside from God to understand his love. But he says, this happens in your inner being through your spirit and also as Christ dwells in your heart. And he says, and I pray that you, uh, you rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp, and here's what he wants us to know, how wide, how long, and how high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love. So he says, I want you to know this love that surpasses knowledge. So you see what he said? It seems to be two contradictory statements, right? He says, I want you to know this love, but it surpasses any knowledge. So what he's saying is, human knowledge cannot bring you into a full understanding of the love of God. It is impossible. You love love each other, um, but the only way you can even love each other rightly is if you have an understanding of how much God loves you. So he says... It surpasses knowledge. I want to let you know. It is beyond your knowledge. It is beyond beyond your comprehension. But before that, he says, I want you to know this love, right? That you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of, of God. So he's saying, listen, one of the most critical things for Christian existence, one of the most critical things for us Living lives that glorify God is whether or not we understand that we are loved. Man. And I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life, and this is the issue, where somebody has loved me well, like say my wife has loved me well, but there's a bunch of stuff going on, and I don't feel loved. You know what I mean? So it's not, a, it's not a question as to whether or not the person is loving me well. The question is, I don't feel loved. And this is what happens with us and God. So here comes this man. He lost everything. He's packing oranges and lemons. He has an encounter with the love of God, and he writes this song. And he writes this song, and he wants us to understand something about the love of God. Here's what verse 2 says. Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, where every stalk on earth a quill, and every one ascribed by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, the stretch from sky to sky. He writes this at one of his lowest points. Here's what he's saying. If we could fill the entire ocean, that's a picture of the Pacific Ocean. If we could fill all of it, not just the Pacific, but every single ocean on earth with ink, go to North Shore and look out and see how much ocean is there. What he is telling us is if we filled all of that with ink, and then the sky became the paper that we wrote on, right? The whole sky, and then... Every stalk, which is a part of a plant, was a pen or a writing instrument. And then every single person on earth was a scribe 
Now, a scribe by trade. Now, this doesn't mean just somebody available to write. This would be like our court, what are they called? Court? Them. <laughs> right? People that type real fast in court. So if all of us were that by trade, that's what we done. So all the ocean, ink, all the sky, a place to write, every single plant, a writing implement, and every single person, a qualified writer, he says, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Every drop of ink would be gone. And we wouldn't be finished. And then he says, and nor could the scroll, I know this is not sky, but there, we would be searching for another place to write because it would all be full. And then he's, so he says, all of that to cause us to get a grasp of the enormity of the love of God. Like, like you couldn't have enough ink. You couldn't have enough pens. You couldn't have enough paper. And you couldn't have enough people to write it. My word. Like, if we could come to terms with how much we, would, we are loved, can I tell you something? Everybody every day would hear something from us about the love of God. Everybody every day. If we understood the love of God for us, we couldn't contain ourselves. People would know that we're loved. They would know. So the question is, what do we need to know? What knowledge do we need to know? What do we have to have in order for us to be in wonder over a God who loves us perfectly and forever? And then in Scripture, simple, simple parables, trying to explain something to us about the love of God. Matthew chapter 13, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then, in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. <laughs> Such a beautiful picture. But when you read that, you should have some questions. When he found it, why didn't he just take it? Right? I mean, you come across a treasure in a field. I gather nobody's looking. Why don't you just take it, right? Why would you go away and then sell everything you had? King, the reason he didn't take it is because God wants us to understand something about our value to him. You are the treasure in a field. Jesus sees you. And in order for you to be his, he goes and gives everything he has. He didn't just show up and take you. He went and gave every single thing he had so you would understand something about your value to him. So that you would understand something about how much he loves you. I, I, and then, you know, I think about this guy. I don't know if he was married or not. I suppose he went home, you know, he's, and he said, honey, we're going to sell everything. And she would have been like, what? But he would have been like, just trust me. What we're going to get is going to far surpass everything that we have. And then it says, in his joy, he sold everything in joy. You know what this means? That when Jesus recognized your value, the Bible says that he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. This wasn't like, oh, I've got to do this. This was like a joyful thing to sell everything or to give his life everything for you who he valued And the hidden part tells you how Jesus searches for us. And then it says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for pearls. 
when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. These are simple parables that are meant to explain to us something about our value to God and how much he loves us. And what this love is supposed to be, once we come in contact with us, is a transformational love. It's a love where you're, you're just never the same. Right? Since Pastor Joe met Rashika, he's never been the same. It was a transformational love. Right? And probably he was like me. The first time, I remember the first time I went, I fell in love with my wife and I went to tell her. Like all before, you know, in my unsaved life, you know, I dated girls, I didn't, had no nervousness. But this is the first time I really loved somebody. I went to tell her that, that I, was, I was interested in her and I had just come, come from golf. I had tried four days in a row to do it. Now I, I, was, I, was, I was, listen, seriously, before I was saved and serious about about, you know, this woman. I was never like this before. I just go say what I had to say. I, had, I was playing golf. I was driving by her house. And I said, stop her. I got up with my golf clubs and everything. No way to get home. It didn't make any sense. And then I went inside and I had this, this towel, you know, and I was wringing the towel. And I was like, I'm Marshall, I... Uh... Right? Because love affected me in a way that nothing else ever had. I was honestly like, who am I? Like, how in the world did this confident guy get into this little meek? And, and, and what she did was she knew she could see it, right? And so I said, you know, I can't remember what I said. <laughs> but you know what she did? She didn't answer. Because she wanted to, she actually told me afterwards, she saw, saw how nervous and stuff I was, and she wanted to, that's not nice. <laughs> that just hit me. <laughs> and it seemed like forever, too. I probably ripped that poor towel in half. But the point is, love transforms when you understand it, right? I, 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 everything changed for me when I met Marshall. But everything also changed for me when I met God. Because the man that met Marshall wasn't the man that used to do all the stuff he did before he got married, before he got saved. So it's a good thing I met Jesus before I met her, right? Because it's a transformational love. And, and we have to understand that no matter what we go through, we are perfectly loved. The Bible tells us we're going to go through troubles. Troubles have nothing to do with whether or not God loves us. They have everything to do with we live in a broken world. That's it. Right? But because we, we struggle to understand that somebody could love us perfectly. I mean, sometimes, I don't know about you, but I feel unlovable. And I feel like, like if, if I mess up, I feel like, you know, I'm going back to God, kind of like the prodigal son, you know, trying to formulate my words. What is he going to think when I get back there and finally tell him I'm sorry for what, what he did? And the story the prodigal son says, even when we feel unlovable, he sprints towards us in love and embraces us before we can even get out a word. That's how much he loves us. We think, the prodigal son thought, my life, what I've done, my, how could my father love me? And the father's like, how could I not love you? You're my son. How could I not love you? It's the love of God for us. My goodness, I'm serious, man. I, I just want to... That's you. And that's where you were. That's you again, the pearl. Now, what does this love of God accomplish for us? The love of God has accomplished for us the forgiveness of our sins, and that's a huge thing. It's such a small uh, phrase, but it's a huge, huge thing because sin was the thing that kept us from being in right relationship with God, right? Now, here's what the Bible tells us about this thing. It says... 
in 1 John 1, 8, 9, if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And then it says he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So he forgives us our sin, but then every time he does, there is a cleansing that takes place. And cleansing means made completely new, basically as if it didn't happen. Imagine that this is a dirty car that got cleaned, right? That's kind of like cleansing. But imagine if every time you clean your car, it didn't just get clean, it got new. Like your car is 20 years old, you clean it, and you have the new car smell and everything back. Right? That's what it's like. This is what God, God's love has a, um, accomplished for us, right? What does God say about his forgiveness? Now, in Scripture, God spends time painting pictures for us to understand how great this forgiveness is. Listen to this picture. It says, in Psalms 103, he does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. Praise God for that. And here's the thing. I don't know about you, but when I read that, some people say when they read that, oh, it's like a license to sin. But I don't know about you, but when you come into contact with somebody who treats you like that, you don't want to sin. Then he says this. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the love, uh, so, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So these, there are all of these pictures in scripture which cause us to understand how he forgives our sin. And we've talked about this east is from the west one a lot, right? The time I was flying on the flight and I went to the, we flew north to south, I got to the top of the earth, there's a directional thing, north, then it's south. And it hit me that if you fly west, you always fly west. East and west never come together anywhere on the globe. North and south come together on the top and the bottom. East and west never. And that says he's removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. But even before he tells us how he deals with our sin, he gives us something to describe his love. And here's what he says. The sun is 93 million miles away from us, right? To the edge of the known universe. The known universe is 14.2, whatever that word is, <laughs> which is 46.5 billion light years. I don't even know what a light year is, but I know it's a long time. 46.3. So here's what God says. Peter, as high as the heavens are above the earth, that's the size of my love for you. And here's the problem of the universe. This is to the edge of the known universe. We ain't got to the end yet. Right? And then after that, he says, I remove your sins from you. Now, in other places of scripture, stand up for me, please. Can you stand up for me for one second? Take your hand. Put it in the small of your back. Right? Now what I want you to do, I hope nobody can do this. I hope there ain't no flexible people in here. Now what I want you to do is to look at your hand. Well, if you're like me, you can have a seat. If you're like me, there is no way you would ever see it, right, without something pulling. Or without there being a call to 911 and saying, John's taking you, right? But in another place in Scripture, he says, when he forgives your sin, he takes it and he puts it behind his back. Because he wants you to understand that when you confess it, as far as his concern, it's removed from you. In another place in Scripture, he says, he throws it into the deepest part of the ocean. In another place in Scripture, he says, he tramples them under his feet. Every single one tells me that when he forgives me, he does not forgive like me, where I keep it in the compartments of my mind for future use when you offend me again. 
You come back and you say, God, I did it again. And he says, did what again? I, I, it's, you don't see it. I did it. What? That's behind my back. That's under my feet. I will never bring that up again against you. Because the blood of Jesus Christ paid for that forgiveness. And therefore, when you genuinely confess it, it's gone. That's the love of God for us. It, it's, it's, ah. And then he says in Ephesians chapter 1, this is how, he, this is how God deals out his love, okay? Now, if you, if you come to my house, right, and I say we have chocolate ice cream for dessert, which is my favorite, right? And, and all of you are there. What I'm going to do is do you our portions to make sure that at the end there's some left for me. <laughs> right? And all of you are looking at me like you ain't like me. <laughs> right? So at the end, I have to have some for myself. Here's how God, here's how God distributes in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. You know what God does when you come for ice cream? He dumps it all on you. All of it. Like, all, he lavished, it says words like lavished on us. What we're going to do now, we're just going to read some, some scripture about God's love, right? Now, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus, this is 1 John 4, is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And look what it says. And so we what? Know. We first have to know it. And what, what do we do next? You cannot rely on that which you don't know. That's why know is first. But then you see what it says? We have to rely on the love of God for us. There is a reliance that we have to have on the love of God. And that is why the enemy shows up to try to convince you that he doesn't love you. Because if he can convince you that he doesn't love you, how can you possibly rely on his love? And if you can't rely on his love, how can you live righteously? If you can't rely on his love, how can you... How can you uh, run away from sin if you can't rely on his love? How can you live holy? It's his love that we rely on. This is how God works. You know why? Because love, not punishment, not law, is what God knew would motivate. Punishment and law don't motivate you, no. Know? Punishment and law motivates you not to do it, but any person who punishes you is there. Love motivates you to do it when a person's not there. And the story that I always tell of this is when I was, okay, this is B.C., okay? So don't go around telling people I did this after I got saved. <laughs> no, I mean, I've done some things after I got saved, but. So I guess I got saved at 25. So in high school, during, you know, the days where I, I smoked that's, you know what I mean. <laughs> so I go home one day, right? And I have some of it in my, my blazer pocket. My grandmother takes it out. She finds it when she's ironing my blazer. You're not supposed to iron a blazer. <laughs> now, in my house, grandmother, my grandmother was love. Honestly, she was the most loving, gracious person I've ever met. And my mom was loving, but she was the law. I've told you this before. My mom hit me with everything in the house except for the fridge because she couldn't pick it up. <laughs> Right? But whenever she would hit me, if she wasn't there, I would do it again. My grandmother brought me in the room, put this stuff on the ironing board, and cried. I never did it again. Because Titus chapter 2 said, it's the grace of God that teaches you to say no. Not the law. You know how all you people are with law? When your mom said, don't touch that, you went and touched it when she weren't looking. Come on. All of us know this. The only time I speed, the only time I speed 
is when I come next to one of those stupid things that tell me how fast I'm going. Do you want by Whitney? I come down the hill by Whitney, and I'm like, here it comes. I want a big number. <laughs> because what Paul says, Paul actually says this, the law causes the sinful man to rise. Right? But grace teaches you to say no. So it says, why do I tell you a lot about my, anyway. Yeah, so if you see me riding my bike by Whitney, just pull over because I'm going to. All right, so, um, so it says, and we know and we rely on. There is a reliance that we have to have on the love of God. You cannot rely on that which you don't know. So spend some time in Scripture. Spend some time in worship. Get in accustomed to how much you are loved by God. And here's the thing. Focus on the right person in the sentence. Because people say this, how could God love me? And they focus on me. Well, if it was just about you, you would never be loved by God. Focus on how could God. And then you will understand that the reason he loves you is because God is love. He can't not love you. Whoever lives in God, I'm sorry, whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. To fall in love with God is the greatest romance. To seek him, the greatest adventure. To find him, the greatest human achievement. I love that. And then this says, everything, there is nothing that exists that doesn't have its being through the love of God. Lamentations chapter 3. Because of, the, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassion never fails. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Psalm 63. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. Isaiah 54, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Ephesians 2, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Romans 5, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners and his enemy, Christ died for us. Jude chapter 1. But you, dear friends, and, and this, is, this is what I've been doing. I've been just reading scripture and meditating on what it has to say on the love of God. By you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, listen to what it says. Keep yourselves in God's love. That actually says that if we're not careful, we could actually stop really believing that God love us, loves us, but still go on living. It's an active thing. Keeping yourself in God's love means do things to keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Psalm 107, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good he is good. His love endures forever. If, like me, you struggle sometimes with understanding that you are perfectly loved by God because of the things that you go through, because of how you feel, then just stand now so I can pray for you. I'm standing because it's something I struggle with.
Father, we live in a world that throws so many things at us. And we live in a culture even now that is not kind or friendly to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to be bombarded by the things that we go through, the sad, the, the, the sad things that we experience. Lord, sometimes, even though we know mentally that you love us, God, we, we struggle because it feels like to us that you've left us. Even though your word says you'll never leave us, nor will you forsake us. God, sometimes we walk through things which cause us to question what we know to be true. And Lord, I pray for all the people who are standing that you would convince them of your love. But God, I also pray this for everybody who's standing, and also myself, that we would allow you to convince us of your love. Because there have been periods in my life where things were so difficult that the only thing that it seemed like I could meditate on was the thing that I was going through. And I couldn't hear from you that you love. God, every decision we take, everything that we do, whether or not we will glorify you will depend on whether we know that we are loved and whether we love you. So God, convince us. Lord, have us to have those genuine times where we just know, like beyond the shadow of a doubt, that you love us. And God, in the times that we struggle, I pray that rather than run from you, we would run to you. Because oftentimes when we struggle uh, to believe that you love us, what we do is we remove ourselves from you. God, help us to come towards you where we'll find a loving embrace and a God who says, despite what you go through, despite what you've done, I love you with an everlasting love. Thank you, God, for scripture that is filled, filled with evidence or, 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 or words from you to tell us how much you love us. Now I pray that we would know and rely on the love of God for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. God loves us. I know it's something we say all the time. But rather than just saying it, we need to know it and rely on it. God bless you.